I'd like to talk briefly about two aspects of private schooling in South Africa. The first is the changing face of the private school sector in the country, and the second is the opportunities for partnerships that that change has created. Let me get into my... There we go. Okay. Before I get into the independent school sector, I'd like to give you a brief bird's eye overview of the schooling sector as a whole in South Africa. It's roughly divided into two categories, public schools and independent schools or private schools. On a brief tangent, people often ask, what is the difference between an independent school and a private school? The short answer is there is no difference. Um, they're two names for the same things, but one can use them interchangeably. The official term is independent school, but people often refer to them as private schools, and that's fine. Public schools are further divided into two categories, Section 20 public schools and Section 21 public schools, which many South Africans colloquially know as former Model C schools. The difference between the two is that the Section 21 schools have a greater de degree of devolved autonomy, primarily in the financial area. Independent schools are also roughly divided into two categories, registered independent schools and, unfortunately, unregistered independent schools. I say unfortunately because by law independent schools have to be registered in South Africa in order to operate. Unfortunately, we do have a fair number that are not registered and therefore they are essentially functioning illegally. Registered independent schools may also be subsidized or not subsidized. I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail there because the subsidy process is fairly complicated. Um, just be aware that they can receive subsidies if they meet certain criteria. If I zoom in on the independent school sector specifically, we like to think of it as a series of concentric circles. The smallest blue circle towards the bottom there is the association I represent, ISASA. We are the largest and oldest association of independent schools in South Africa. We have just on 700 members at the moment, 698, although that tends to change um, if we gain schools or if we lose a few schools. We are part of the larger alliance of independent school associations, which has roughly 1,200 school members. And we all fall within the registered circle of independent schools. The current official figure as to the number of registered independent schools in South Africa is just under 1,600. We think that's probably an undercount. Um, if we look at the various associations that we have interactions with, and we do cross-association calculations, we think that number's probably closer to about 2,500, counting primary and secondary schools separately. That nebulous gray thing floating above um, the sector as a whole, that's the unregistered independent schools. Nobody knows how many of those there are. We think 500, probably more, certainly not less. Um, unfortunately, because they operate illegally, it's very difficult to gather statistics. They actively do not want to be found for people to gather statistics about them. So um, the quality is also entirely unknown. And unfortunately, often when there is a problem in the independent school sector, it's something to do with one of those schools. Um, and there's not a great deal the registered or the associated independent schools can do about that. Um, but we tend to be caught up and the sector as a whole often gets given a bad name for that reason. What have been some of the interesting changes in the independent school sector over the last 10 or 15 years? There's been a rapid growth in the number of schools. Since the demise of apartheid in 1994, the school numbers have grown from around 500 to our estimate of around 2,500 this year. The number of learners in independent schools has almost doubled in the last 10 years. It is admittedly off a low base, and one must always bear that in mind, because the independent school sector makes up only about 6 to 7 percent of the entire South African school system. But still, it's a significant growth in a 10-year period. Perhaps most importantly has been the changing demography of the sector. Um, whereas, if one previously were to say private school to someone, what are the first things that come to mind? Wealthy, elitist, exclusive, and in South Africa, usually white. Um, and that was the sector about 30 years ago. Thankfully, it's not the sector anymore. We now have a range of schools from very low fee to very high fee. 73% of learners in independent schools in South Africa are black. It's an interesting statistic. Most people don't know that. Um, the fastest growing market for independent schools is the black middle and working class. That's how the sector has changed in the last 10 to 15 years. What about us as ISASA? We're a voluntary association. We provide professional and collegial services to schools. We're not a governing body for schools. 
We can recommend to schools, um, we can suggest to schools, sometimes we can plead and beg with schools, but we cannot compel schools to do anything. Um, we are more of a services organisation. As I said, we're just under 700 members, 657 in South Africa, 41 outside South Africa, because we're a Southern African association. We have schools in Angola, Botswana, Swaziland and Namibia, and we've just enrolled a member school in Zimbabwe as well. Um, roughly 12,500 teachers work in our member schools, and we educate about 157,000 pupils, all in all. As with the sector, we have a range from very low to very high fee schools, and almost any kind of school that you can imagine. Large and small, rural, urban, religious, secular, monastic, co-educational, we have them all as members. That is a very brief breakdown of the fee levels of the schools in our association. As you can see, we still primarily have high fee schools, but the significant growth is actually in the other categories. And that yellow category that you can see in the middle, of which we have about 140 members at the moment, that's our fastest growing category of member schools. And that's what we would consider to be schools serving the middle, middle class in South Africa. Um, pictures, as they say, are worth a thousand words. So, for example, the Wiccan Collegiate is a member of ours, but so is Lebethol School in Tugela Ferry in rural KZN. St. John's College is a member of ours in Johannesburg, and so is Nanaga Primary in Colchester in the Eastern Cape. Those are the kinds of school ranges that we have in our association. What are some of the trends that I'd like to make you aware of? A rapid growth of schools, obviously there would have to be if the sector has grown to this extent over the last 10 years. There's been some growth amongst the non-profit established traditional private schools that most people would be familiar with, but the real growth has come in chains of schools, for-profit, non-profit, high fee, low fee, but the recognition that a chain school provides certain advantages and methods of expanding throughout the country that individual schools may not necessarily. Some of them people are familiar with, Crawford schools, the Kuro schools, which are very aggressively expanding at the moment, but new chains of schools that have started up literally in the last two to three years, Meridian schools, which, Crawford, which Kuro has now bought, Spark schools, 1886 Foundation schools, African School for Excellence, these are all mid to low fee chain schools that are setting up in South Africa because they see a niche market here. They see a demand for education at that fee level that may not necessarily be satisfied by the public school sector in certain, in certain areas. There's also increasing international interest. We've been talking to the International Finance Corporation about financing for these medium and low fee independent schools. There are a group of Indian investors who are looking to set up some chain schools in South Africa and additional interest from British investors. We've tried to plot them more or less on the continuum of low to high fee um, I won't go through this in any detail, but it's available in the presentation. Where do those various school chains fit in terms of fee levels and in relation to each other? You can see that Kuro spans quite a range of fees, from about 15,000 up to 67,000. And a lot of the lower fee schools cluster between 10 and 15,000 per annum. The reason for that is that doing financial analysis, schools find that those are the fee levels they need to charge as a chain in order to make themselves financially viable without additional assistance in the form of donors or sponsorships or subsidies. I won't, I'm not going to go into any great detail on issues in independent schooling. Um, perhaps I will just highlight the bottom one. Increased competition, more schools, more for-profit chain schools means more competition between schools. It also means more choice for parents. It's a good thing for parents. Um, skipping through that, what I really want to focus some attention on is what opportunities for partnerships does this create? Um, there's a whole segment of the sector that wasn't there four to five years ago. And what does that mean for organizations who are looking to engage with independent schools? Um, I think it means three things. One can still partner with an association such as ISASA, not exclusively ourselves. There are many other independent schools associations that one could talk to. Um, the, 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 I mean, the advantage there is we can spread information to our school members rapidly. The disadvantage possibly is that we don't make decisions on behalf of the schools. We can tell them, but it's still up to the individual school to decide what to do with that information. One could look at partnerships with a chain of schools. The advantage there is that they generally have a national reach or a very good regional reach. 
Um, they make centralized decisions on things such as procurement, so you only have to talk to one organization, not many. The disadvantage there is that sometimes it is a bureaucratic process, as often a centralized process can be. Or one can partner with an individual school, which gives you immediate access to low level project, sorry, local level projects and initiatives. Twinning and community development, almost 70% of our member schools, and that includes both high fee and low fee schools, have some form of twinning or community partnership with public schools in the areas around them. In fact, our schools reach more teachers and more learners through those partnerships with public schools that, that, than they teach in their own schools. That's another interesting statistic. Um, and obviously the advantage of partnering with an individual school is that you get direct decision making at the school level. Um, if I can put my Asasa hat on briefly, um, we, as an example of a partnership, um, we have a mathematics and English program where we are looking to contribute to quality education for all learners in Southern Africa, specifically in scarce skills areas such as mathematics, science, business subjects and English. Um, we have two components to this program. The one is to bring promising learners into ISASA member schools at the FET level, that is grades 10 to 12, and to put them through a process of intensive mentoring during that period so that they can achieve high quality passes in those subjects in their matriculation examinations and go on to tertiary education in that area. The other is to mentor teachers in our member schools, teacher learnerships essentially is what these are, where the teachers have the opportunity to teach in these schools, to shadow teachers from these schools and to learn best practice from them. And they are then funded either through donors, sponsors or a combination of both. And we hope that those teachers will then go back into both public and independent schools to provide high quality teaching input. We currently are partnering with the Department of Basic Education on the teacher intern side and organizations such as Investec and Transnet and the CETA, the Sectoral Education and Training Authority that looks after education. But obviously any additional involvement would be most welcome in that area. And if people are interested in other partnerships, either with ISASA itself, with other associations or with individual schools, please do contact me and I'm sure there's someone we can put you in contact with. Thank you.